so what are we covering today? All right, I'm going to do a two minute review on inner joins because now you've had a week to percolate and apparently a killer lab. Uh, you know, sometimes I overestimate the easiness of things, especially when I have to recreate all my labs from scratch. So, you know, the proven labs that have been tweaked for, you know, difficulty curve are tossed to the side and I come up with something I think is a great idea. That doesn't always work out that way. But if nothing else, there's one good piece of news. That's probably the hardest lab you'll have in this class the whole term. No, no, the one you just finished doing. That is the worst you're going to get. <laughs> There's nothing like that on the exam. All right. So well, I'm going to review inner joins quickly. I'm going to talk about left and right joins. I'm also going to talk about subqueries. Out of all of today's topics, the subqueries is the worst. Um, you will see this stuff in pages 32 to 38 in a booklet I recently uploaded. For those of you who look at that book and you'll recognize the horrible writing style, which is mine. That was the booklet I used before there was a required textbook for this course. It's years worth of little, you know, documents I've put together into a, into a consecutive, well-formatted booklet for people's information. So if you go looking for it, it's under course documents, additional documents, should be the last one at the bottom. All right. Now, the inner joins. Slide, slide from last week, more or less. The most commonly used join type is the inner join. It returns records that match in both tables. Now, does anybody need clarification about how the join works? If you haven't started doing la this lab yet, lab seven, probably should have started. Um, it's challenging. And some of it is because people are learning the syntax of the join. Um, if you don't have any questions, I'll move to the next slide. I've just given people a chance to ask a question about regular joins before I continue. Right, left and right joins. Now this is the new stuff. These are known as outer joins. And essentially what, how it works is you can return all the records from one table that have a partial match in another table, either to the left or to the right. And if you don't match data, it returns it as a null. Now, when I do the demo, I've set myself up to demonstrate this fairly well. Um, but essentially, it, these kinds of joins are used, they're not commonly used, but they're used to find out, for example, what products haven't sold recently, uh, what employees have not placed orders in the last month, who's not meeting their quotas. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't, I wasn't thinking of you, okay. Um, or you could also see which products, you know, nobody's bought orders for for months. Or sometimes you get broken data and you use to find broken data. Um, so what happens when you run the query? Anything that's not matched returns nulls. So it basically gives you empty fields. Now, remember when I was talking before about how the order of the tables isn't, is important, but it's not that important? When you're doing left and right joins, the order is very important because you use the relative position in the query to determine where the join is. So what I'm going to do is, before I go to the next slide, I'm actually going to demonstrate the left and the right joins. That way, it'll be fresh as I'm talking about it. And it'll make, make a bit more sense when you can actually see the data in action. Hold on, I just got to check one thing.
camera was too low, it's cutting off my head. Right there. Okay, and I'm looking at the wrong camera. That's the one I need. All right. <laughs> That's funny, you see my error message. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. So this is the ThinkCube database, once again. Now, this is the list of countries. This database has a fairly reasonable list. It has 19 countries. Now, to do a join, you guys have seen this before. Let me make this bigger. Oh my. Can you tell I haven't touched a computer in four days? Typing skills, non-existent. All right, so I'm returning a list of countries along with, you know, various other pieces of information. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go mangle my database a little bit just so you have an idea what's happening. All right, so I just mangled my data lots. And this hasn't changed very much. The, re the report, the re query is still returned the same number of rows. I've just modified it so that certain values aren't showing up here anymore. So let's say I want to turn this around and go select star from countries. And I'm going to go left join customers. Customers country underscore ID is equal to countries dot ID. I'm going to go run. Now, countries are up here. Once I go right to the bottom of the return list, notice I've got countries coming back, but there's no customer information. These are all nulls. This is a left join. So what's happening is it's going to grab all the values from countries and only value some customers where there's matching data. If there is no matching data, it'll return null values for the customer. Therefore, if I reduce this so the data is a little easier to read, if I go countries.id, countries.name, uh, customers, ID and customers dot name. And I do this instead so that the list is a little bit smaller. You'll see now it's a little easier to, to actually witness what's happening. Just let me get to the end. Oh my. For the joins? Well, it's not that you have to be really specific, is if you're expecting certain things to happen and they don't, you have to check your query. So if you can see here, I'm left joining customer, I'm left, I'm pulling from countries, left joining customers. What left saying is, give me everything to the left of the join. So if I were to restructure this just a hair, no, right here, Countries, left join customers. Left join means give me everything to the left of the concept of left join. So that means give, give me all the countries plus any matching customers. Now, when I was saying the order of the tables is important, 
let's just say I'm working with three or four different tables. And depending on where you put the left join, it'll impact the results because it's going to, it's cascading the, the conditions, right? So the more conditions you have, the more iffy the left and the right join business becomes. And for those of you that wonder what the right join does, it does the exact opposite. Now I'm actually going to flip the two tables, and I'm going to do a right join, because my data is not set up to go right. Now if I do this, now you'll have the same result because I flip the tables around. I flip the tables around, that means instead of joining to the left, I'm joining to the right. If I were to flip it the other way, so I return it the way it was, right, I'll return 10,000 rows, and you'll see there's no, no, there's no, right, hold on, I saw, I think I saw a gap in here somewhere. No, no gap. So you can see I did a, a left join, and there are there is a record for every country and customers. Therefore, it looks like a normal query. If I flip it back the way it was, so I'm doing the right join instead, and you'll see it's returning 10,114 because there's 14 countries that don't have matching customers. That's what the left and the right join does. Like I said, it's a very specific purpose kind of query. Normally, you use it to find products that aren't selling very well or products that haven't sold in the last month. Or you also use it for cut, find out if somebody hasn't logged in recently. And you can also add on a where clause. For example, let's say I want to just know the orphaned records. Now, for those of you that don't know what that means, it means an orphaned record can mean one of two things. It can be an orphaned parent where it's a value in a parent table, such as countries, that's never used. Or it could be an orphaned child where, in Postgres, by the way, designing it properly is impossible because it won't let you. But in databases like MySQL where referential integrity is not always enforced, it's entirely possible to nuke a parent record and still have child records laying around. It's really bad. Just putting it out there, it's not a good thing. Um, but let's say you just want to know which ones are orphaned. You can go after, for example, the customers right join countries. I, in this case, I can go after the customers and I can go where customer ID is null. Once I do this, it'll just give me the orphaned records. That's about as complicated as left and right join gets. It's just like a regular join, except you're, you're changing the rules of how it interprets the data. Um, lab 8 explores this, Lab 9. Lab 8, well, Lab 8, I think. Explores this a little bit. Um, there's not a lot of questions on it. But essentially, if you're watching this recording while you're doing it, you've got pretty much the answer to some of the questions, I think. I'm not 100% sure, but I've done that in the past by accident, where I've given out the answers as part of my demo. I'm just going to give a second because people are typing furiously. That, no, the on clause just defines how the relationship is connected. The order from the, the left and the right depends on, you know, if you're doing a left join, it's everything from the left of the word join. If it's a right join, it's everything to the right of the word join. In other words, the table to the right of the word join. Now, if you have two or three joins in here, the left and the right start meaning a lot more because it's, it starts cascading, right, the effect of the left and the right. Um, for example, if you were going to join, do the right join countries at the end, but you join, say, or an orders table in there, you'd probably be okay. But if you did, you know, countries first and then the customers and then join the orders, it may affect the results of your query because it's going to ex examine how your, your intent behind what you wrote. 
And it's this, the right and left joins where the syntax of what you're writing. Not the syntax as in is it proper SQL, it's the interpretive syntax of what you wrote becomes important. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like the intent of what you wrote is important as opposed to the syntax. Because the only difference in syntax between this and an inner join is you're changing the word inner for left or right. It's the syntax of what you're running is important. Like the syntax of what you're running verbally is what becomes important, as in what's your intent. And if you wrote and you think you're right and it's not giving you what you wanted, there's a chance, you know, how you wrote it is wrong. And you need to go dig around a little more until you're, you've achieved a point where you're 100% right if you're right. Okay. Any other questions about left and right joins? There's not really a lot more to say to that. If you know how to do it, if you can figure out how to do a join, left and rights are easy. It's just a case of understanding that it's positional. Left means left of the word join, right means to the right of the word join. And it affects just that particular join. But if there's other joins stayed staggered above or below it, it may affect those also because, you know, to the left of the word join. Yeah. It'll display all the data to the left of the join or all the data to the right of the join as depending, depending which keyword you choose to use. And anywhere it doesn't find any matches, it returns nulls. Um, like a good example I said was finding out products I haven't sold in a while. Um, for example, you have a list of products and you have a list of orders. And you do select star from products join orders where, say, order date is less than one year from today. And you do it as a left join, which means it'll give you all the products plus the orders, and then suddenly you have a list of products with no orders next to them. Then if you go where the order ID is null, you'll suddenly know the products that haven't sold in a year, and therefore why even add display that you sell it. It's a good time to retire products you don't sell, because it's a waste of time and effort for everyone. Okay. This is the one I hate teaching more than joints. Subqueries. Now, one of you has already been playing, at least one of you has been playing with subqueries. I think I've seen two or three of you use subqueries. And I always wait to teach subqueries until after I've taught joins uh, for a few different reasons. Uh, one, as I've said to that student and a few other students, a subquery is like using a sledgehammer to put in a drywall screw. It works. It's also excessive overkill for 90% of the applications, right? Big hammer, screw. You don't use a hammer for a screw. You can get it in the wall, but it's not how you're supposed to do it. Subqueries are fantastic because they're really, really flexible. Subqueries suck because they're really expensive to use. And it's easy to make mistakes because you not only have to worry about one query, you're worrying about two or more queries. So what are subqueries? Subqueries are embedded queries. It's a query inside of another query. Also known as, in, it's also known as query inception. Query inside of query inside of query. And much like the movie, every time you go a layer down, you're slowing down time because you're adding processing. And depending on how a kind of subquery you use, it slows everything down. Now, what's the rule about brackets in math? Brackets are run first. In SQL, subqueries are contained inside of brackets. So what does that mean? It runs the query first. What it does, it runs that query and then returns the values of that query to the outer query. So it, you build up some data here and you pass it out to the other one. So remember when I taught you guys about in, in a list? That's one of the common uses for the subquery is in, because you build a list based on another query. You can, that's where you use it in the where clause. You can use it in the select list, because you can. It's, is it a good idea? No. 
but you can. You can even use it as a table, as a virtual table. And when I get to talking about using them as a table, I'll give you the proper name for that. And as the last item says, they're bracketed. Okay. I'm going to get rid of the subquery in a field selection list. And there is a typo on my slide. Damn it, Jim. Not Jim, wherever you are, if you're here. Uh, but yeah. Okay. When you use a subquery as part of a field selection list, you're using it to return a single value from a secondary table. It's often used to set initial values from a parent table or a reference table. Now, often people will sit there and create a new table, and they go, oh, I created a table, I inserted some values, and then they create some sample data, and they map out all those values, and it's great. And then you dump the database, and it ignores the primary keys, and you reload it, and none of your queries work because all the values changed. Because primary keys should not be relied upon between instances. So you back it up and you restore it, there's a good chance primary keys will come back, but it's not always a guarantee. They might get reordered, depending on what database server you're working with. This, for example, I have here, allows you to pull the ID from a reference table based on the name. So for example, if you know that you always have a new record, for example, uh, call status, call status is new, which you don't always know for a fact if new is one or three or five, you can actually run it as part of a query and it'll return that value so you can insert it. So basically you're dynamically generating your data as you go. It's very um, single purpose. It's the only time you'd ever use something like this realistically. That one you do not have in any of your labs. Don't panic. It's never going to show up on a test. I just discuss it because it exists. This one, on the other hand, shows up everywhere. This is the, uh, by default, most used way of a subquery. Now, you use it to generate lists. So when it's part of a, a where clause, you're, it's assuming that you're going to use it as a list. Now, people say, well, why would you use it as a list? Because realistically, what is a query but returning you a list of data? So when you use a subquery, you allow, it allows you to create a small subset of data and then pass those values out. And I'll be doing demonstrations on this in a bit. And then you can actually retrieve other pieces of information one by one that way. Um, and you can nest them multiple layers deep. And in a few moments before I start doing the demo, I'll explain why uh, they're expensive and why it sucks to use them. Um, now, like I said on the slide, it most commonly used the in, as you can see from here. Select star from order lines where the product version ID is in a given list. And what is this list? It gives the ID from product versions where the products are active. In other words, only show me order lines where the products are still active. Now, let's just say, if you're a company that only sells five or six things, you probably don't even need to use a subquery. If you're a company that sells thousands of different products, you're going to end up using queries like this all the time to figure out what you've sold recently. You'd normally also stick on a timestamp on this some sort, a where clause for this date range. That would show me all the products that were active that we shipped in the last month. Alternatively, we could say, give me everything that's no longer active that we shipped in the last month. And you can play with the data and it'll give you completely different result sets. But that is basically what a subquery looks like. What it does, it'll run this one completely, assemble all the data, and then pass it out to the outer query as, well, as a list. So if the result set that you'd normally get from the product versions would be one, two, three, four, what it would happen is in the in clause, it would suddenly become in like that. And that probably looks familiar. So the subquery basically converts a result set into a set of values. It's just a list. All right. I'm going to do a demo of those two items before I show the last one. 
These ones actually, when people have a hard time with joins, sometimes get the subqueries easier because they say, I'm building a list. All right, so for example, I'll do the first one. Now, as you notice, I barely even have a from clause. ID 5, you can say I ran a query, and then I returned it. Now, this looks kind of dumb because it's not part of something else. But let's just say I we're going to turn this into and I can do this and I'm returning it looks like real data. And some of you might be going, well, what the heck's the point of that? I don't even know if that's what these columns are called. And I'm going to break it down on another line so it's not wrapping too far. Let's see how many more errors I can generate while I'm doing this. Oh, I got it right. All right, so essentially what's happening is I'm dynamically generating some insert information. So I'm inserting the ID of a country where the name's called Canada, a name, an address, and then an ID from the state province. All this return something like this. And when I do this insert like this, it just passes these values out. Yeah, like I said, normally this, like I said, this is used when you're generating fresh data for a database. It's pretty much the only time you use a subquery as part of a field selection list. This is considered a field. That's a field, that's a field, and this is a field. As you can see, it's not even coming from a table. It's just generating it on the fly. Not particularly useful. I'm just waiting until the bad typing ends. All right, for starters, I'm going to just run the inner query. And you can see I'm re returning two IDs. And I'm going to run this. And it'll give me all the customers that are in Canada and France. Now, the advantage is I don't need to know what the IDs are of these countries. I just need to know what they're called. If you are just working with one or two countries, it would probably be more efficient to just put, to find out what the two IDs are for those countries and just use the IDs. But if you're suddenly working with a more complex situation where you want to know where none of the, where the countries are no longer active and you don't know which ones those are, and these values might change at a drop of a hat because while you're crafting your query, somebody goes and deactivates a country. Like, you know, like Yugoslavia, no longer were active. <laughs> <laughs> that was for a specific student. Um, but, you know, it's like saying this country is no longer active. And suddenly, while you can write a, query, write a query that works like this, where 
you don't need to worry about what which ones are specific values if you have a search that looks for specific sets of information. So if you're trying to find where all the products are no longer active, and while you're happily crafting your list of 25 possible IDs, somebody goes and hits a switch and deactivates one, your query is no longer active. I mean, a valid. But if you were to go where the flag is, product is no longer active, as a product active is false, you don't need to know what the list is because the subquery takes care of it for you. Now, this is something some of you may have seen, some of you may not have seen. It's this button right here. It's called explain. For most of you, this means nothing. However, it just shows you there's a bit more of a complexity when you start doing these weird kinds of queries where you're trying to, when you start nesting subqueries. For example, if I were to run Okay, so I happen to know 5 and 7 is for Canada and France. I'm just going to explain that one. You can see it just scans just the customer table. However, when I do a subquery, that took 12 milliseconds. I do the subquery, also took 12 milliseconds because now the data is cached. However, as you can see how many more objects it had to scan to get to the same result because the data is dynamic. It scans all the countries. It does a little piece of magic hash, not that kind of hash, and it merges the results with the customer. And therefore, it then gives a list of the customer, and it's like magic at that point. It gets filtered out. Um, there isn't a lot more to subqueries in general than this. However, there are some implications when you're doing subqueries. Uh, one of the big implications is for this kind of a subquery, the inner query is run only once, right here. It runs what's inside the brackets, returns the result, and done. When you run it as part of the select criteria, it will run those subqueries for every one. So every row that gets returned, it'll run the subquery every single time, which means you might be running a query once, but if it returns 10,000 rows, you're going to run 10,001 queries. Subqueries are expensive. Um, when I first started teaching this course, I used to use MySQL, and I managed to blue screen my laptop during my demo because I showed them what not to do. Uh, I've never been able to get Postgres to blue screen my laptop. Um, but you can keep nesting and nesting and nesting and nesting, and that's fine. And the good news is it tends to cache the results of the previous queries, so the performance in general doesn't take too much of a hit from, from this. However, there is one other kind of subquery, and it's known as a correlated subquery. And my database is not set up for that. I'll put it out there right now. Um, however, in that booklet that I pointed out somewhere in here, around there, around page 36 in the booklet, there's an example of a correlated subquery. What you'll notice right here is I'm aliasing one of my tables, but I'm referring to it inside the subquery. Now for you, those of you that don't know what that means, it means that the subquery has to be aware of what's happening on the outside. And how can it know what's happening on the outside unless data is being passed in? But it's got to pass in data for every record it finds. So suddenly if it's pulling back 5,000 rows, it's going to run this subquery 5,000 times. It doesn't sound too painful until you realize you're running the same query 5,000 times over and over and over again. The good news is a lot of products like Postgres are pretty smart. They cache the results. The more you do it, the faster it gets because it's optimizing its search patterns. And then some other guy runs a totally different query and throws out your caching. 
So with subqueries, they're cool. They worked well. But as I was identifying to certain people, they also act like a sledgehammer. Um, and then, you know, in here, there's some really serious um, complex queries in the example in this booklet. But I would recommend you take a look-see because you can also use them in a having clause. As you can see, it really gets gross, really, really complicated. Um, this is not one of my examples because I'd never write something like this. I'd find some other way to write it, just saying. Uh, but this shows an example of the different places you can use correlated subqueries. Okay, now, that's how a subquery behaves. There's not much more to it than that, other than you have to be aware of the implications. It's a bit like uh, when you pour in some extra ethanol in your gas to give your car a bit more pep. It may make the job easier to do. It might get you there a little bit faster. What kind of damage you can do to your engine in the process. It's not always a good thing. And now for the last set of slides. Okay. This is the one that blows people's minds the most. So far you guys know what a table is, right? A table's a bin that holds data. You've played with them a fair amount by now. You've done the good old select star from this and, you know, select star from that, select name from here. Sometimes you have the odd case where you need more. And you need more in such a way that it doesn't fit the bill, the normal joins. So you end up with something called a subquery as part of a table list. This is also known as a derived table. Remember when we discussed about the derived attributes where you don't store them because you calculate them on the fly? If you do a subquery as part of a table list, also known as a derived table, this means you're creating a table on the fly. The table lives only for the duration of the query. Often it's used when you're trying to clean up your data. When you're not 100% sure of what the structure is going to be on the other side. Or you need to uh, match on strange sets of criteria. Now, when you look at the example they have here, what's happening is they want to retrieve specific pieces from the author's table and then they're joining it to titles. Now this is an example of like a library type database where you got authors and you know titles which is a book and then title, 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 authors as another table that joins things in. Remember the whole those of you that tried to do an aggregate on an aggregate and you couldn't do it? This is how you do an aggregate on an aggregate. Remember I promised it two weeks ago I'd show you how to do it? I'll show you guys how to do an aggregate on an aggregate in just a minute. It's the only way to aggregate your aggregates. God, that sounds terrible to say. It's a horrible sentence to say. But it's the only way to do it. And often that's the most common use for it is to aggregate your aggregates. The other time you'll use it is, let's say you have one table where a customer's name is separated into two separate pieces and yet you're trying to join it to another table where their name is one field, you can use the subquery to actually concatenate your columns into one so you can search downrange from there. But I'll show you guys doing using the aggregates because that's the best way to do it. I need this window here. Okay.
All right, so this isn't a complete mystery. It's similar to stuff I've shown you guys already. It should look similar to the kind of stuff you were doing last week, actually. Different database, same kind of work. Now, let's just say I want to know what the average number of customers per country is. As in, I don't mean how, what's the average number of customers in Canada. I want to know, on average, how many customers there are per country. It's not a query you can, I can normally somebody would say, well, can't you just go like this and just show you guys and see once again, aggregate functions cannot be nested. That's a no-no. Instead, you need to create a derived table. And it looks something like this. I'll start it simple. However, when you create a derived table, you always have to give it an alias. Now, some of you are going, why do you have to always have to give it an alias? You have to always give it an alias because the SQL parser doesn't know what to call this a table, therefore it's going, select star from what? You gave me a bunch of gobbledygooks without a name. If you give it a name, it then knows what to call it. Because it, it creates, a, they call it a virtual table in memory. It takes the results of this first query here, and instead of returning it to the end user, it puts it in a bin in memory, and it gives that bin a name. Then you go select star from this bin, and it'll look exactly the same as what you saw before. And if I do a table scan, You'll see, it's exactly what you guys have seen before. Doesn't look any different. However, I'm going to give my count here a new name. And now I have an average. Because it treats this as a table. It's a table sitting in memory. It has a name. It doesn't need to know it was an aggregate because it takes the results of the query and stores it in memory. When you now process the results of that first query that are in memory as part of another query, then the magic happens. You can do an aggregate. Now, it doesn't mean I can do, you know, the minimum average because then you do an aggregate and an aggregate again. You're not allowed to do that. However, I can do some math on this. And there's my numbers, the min, the max, and the average. It's a bit like magic. And that's how you do the aggregate on an aggregate, by using a derived table. Um, other purposes for the derived table um, would include Like I said, pulling disparate data from one source to another. Um, or sometimes you need to retrieve records and you, you know how I did the in previously? And I did in where the name list of countries is this. Sometimes you actually want that as a table coming back because you're trying to use it as a join on multiple tables. So for example, you could have a setup where a country the country's table is used in more than one place. For example, it's used for a shipping address versus a mailing address. And you want to retrieve all the addresses from one or the other. And you could use, therefore you'd want to use that instead of being as a, in the where clause, where you'd have to have it twice, you have it as part of the from, and it only needs to run it once. But you could do it in either place, and it would both work. It's just optimization at this point. If you want to shave those milliseconds off your queries and understandability. So this is known as the derived table. And I'm pretty sure I just gave you the answer to one of the lab questions. If I didn't, it's probably pretty close to this. Um, 
Now, there's one more topic I'm covering today, and it's not on the slide. Um, because I was depending on how long this took to get through. I was going to push it to next week if it, the first part of this took too long. And I'm just going to stay seated for this. There are two, there's one more kind of query in SQL. And these are called set operations. Now, do you guys remember, how many of you have taken sets in math? Three hands. Great. How many of you remember the phrase union intersect? You know, a data set intersects with another data set. Probably took it in matrices or uh, data management, depending. I don't remember what the math, I, we didn't take it when I was in high school. That was part of finite math when I was in school. So those of us that are old enough to remember OACs, that would have been OAC finite math. And I didn't take it. Neither did you, apparently. Um, so there was specific kinds of math. My daughter just finished taking part of it, and she wanted to cry in grade 11. So, uh. so the way these work, set operations work, is you take the results of one query, and you compare them to the results of another query. Now you're saying, oh, that sounds a bit like a subquery. Not quite. So I'm going to pull the name and the email address from my customers. <coughs> now, as you can see, we have data. I've also imported a t uh, database called Trade Show Leads. Into the same database. And you'll see again, I've got names and email addresses. So I'm going to change this to be name, comma, email. So if I run this query now, it should look, behavior-wise, exactly the same as the first one, roughly. Now here's what's magical. With the set operations, there's three and a half. There's union. Union says, give me all the distinct values from both tables. By distinct, it means not just distinct by column, it means the entire row has to be distinct. So right now, this is returning 10,001 rows. Well, 10,101. If I run this, I, semicolon. Now I got 10,974 rows. Now you guys are going, well, then how do I know where it's coming from? I'm just going to throw on an, uh, an empty string at the end so to uniquely identify the two rows. And right now, this is going to completely screw up my query. So as you can see now, I've got 11,000 and change. And some of you are wondering, well, why is it this, such a difference? Now I'm going to run the first one. 1,329, 101001. If I do 10, 10, plus the 1329, you end up with this number. So this is to demonstrate what the union is actually doing. What it does is it takes the values from each of the columns and compares them to all the other columns coming from the second query. So if I run this without that extra column, we have 10,974. So if I take that, that previous number, what the heck was that again? 11,430? Let's see if you're right. Yeah. So if I've got... Eleven thousand four hundred and thirty rows, which is basically all of customers plus all leads. 
is equal to this. However, when I run the union, I end up with 10, oops, 10, 974. Yeah, I know I'm really old school, aren't I? Carry the one. Four hundred and fifty six. Now you're going, well what heck does four hundred and fifty six mean? That means that there are 456 email addresses repeated between the two tables. Email addresses and names as a whole. So what it does, it compares this is going to be the most choppy video yet. What it does, it looks at the complete set of the values of the name and the email combined. And then it looks at everything coming out of the first table. So it'll grab all the values from customers. And then it'll say, now give me all the values coming from leads that are not already in this pile. So it gives you the unique list, the clean list of the customers or the email addresses. Now some of you are going, well, what's the use of the, this kind of a query? Well, I've written tons of these. Every time we spam our customers at work, or sorry, we send out promotional material. God, my marketing guy hates it when I use the word spam. But you know, what else can you describe sending out 34,000 email emails a week? <laughs> you know? But they all signed up for that list. So it's not because they requested it. Um, however, what happens is we have a what we call a leads bin and a customer's bin. The customers are people that have bought something from us at some point. The leads bin is pros prospects. Somebody came to a trade show left, you know, and swiped their little guest pass at the trade show, and then we get their email address. They may have never bought anything from us, but we want to email them, hey, we're having a sale, you know, $300 off our top end package for the next two weeks. But the thing is, we also want our existing customers to upgrade. Therefore, we want to send that promotion to them too. Now, what happens if a customer has been to the trade show booth and we collected their email address as a potential lead, but they're also an existing customer. I don't want to send an email out to him twice because that's just not nice. Therefore, what we end up doing is I'll go select everything from our customers and then I'll union in the, le the leads. Therefore, it'll give me all the email addresses out of our customer's bin plus any email addresses that are not in a customer's bin. So when you look at it and you do the Venn diagram, oh joy, When you do a union, it grabs everything for customers plus anything here from leads. And uh, yeah, that's a union. Now, The other one, if I were to turn around, who remembers what it, not, I haven't spoken about it, but from your math classes, who remembers what intersect does? Yeah. Intersect is this. Intersect is where it exists in only both tables at the same time. So if I run this query, if I have 456, which is what I had, my number was earlier, I think when I did my little math on the board, I hope that's what it was, then otherwise I'm displaying how bad my math skills are. What this does, it says, give me all the name and email addresses from customers that are also in the leads, and only those. In other words, discard anything that is unique 
to both tables and only give me what's shared between them. Which, you know, is a useful query. Sometimes you want to know how many people are in both your leads bin and your customers bin. That way, you know how much duplicated data you have. Or maybe, like for where I work, when somebody downloads a demo on the internet and they activate their demo, they go in as a lead. I can then search for customers that have activated a demo as a lead in the last month, so we can target them for specials. Hey, you downloaded a demo of Sign Lab 10. Sign Lab 11 is coming shortly. Use this coupon for you know two hundred dollars off. Congratulations. Or we'll here have a coupon to upgrade from Cut Pro to Vinyl Pro for free. Promotions like that. And those would be the kind of people we target for that. Yeah. It, it's everything from customers plus anything from leads that's unique to leads. So it's really hard to draw as a Venn diagram. Right? It's basically because I'd have to go right across the whole thing, but that's not how it is because it's everything from customers plus any uniqueness in leads, right, over here. But how do you draw it? It's just a big, a big solid block of red going like this. Yeah, theoretically. Um, so the, the blue is the intersect. So the last set operator that exists that people are used to experiencing is, and it has a couple of different names. And unfortunately, this is one of the ones where none of the database guys agreed what they call it. It's most commonly known as accept. But Oracle insists on calling it minus. Anybody want to take a guess what this is going to do? I, almost. It'll only give me values, yes, only values out of customers that are not found in here at all. That means I just want to find the customers that we have that have never registered as a lead. Alternatively, we run promotions it's the other way around. Give me everything in leads that aren't in customers. So we want to find complete virgin leads. These are people that, as far as we know, unless their email address changed, of course, they've never, we, they've never bought anything from us. So I'm going to run this query, and I'm actually going to invert the two, the two queries. So I'm going to say, give me everything from leads except the ones that are in customers. In other words, I want all the virgin leads, which is 873. Now, if you remember right, there's like 13 and 1329 in this table originally in the trade show leads. If I do the accept magically, I now have 873. I'm looking at my tiny little font there. And what that's saying is these are the unique email addresses that have never bought anything from us before. Therefore, we can, they've registered a demo, they've passed through a trade show booth, we bought their email addresses from a trade publication, because that's a legitimate way of getting people's email addresses, apparently. No, really, people send little cards into like signs now, signs in the signs of the times, for example. And they get a, oh, please send your, you can share my email address with your partners. You know, you get that checkbox when you register software, share my email address with your partners. That's where that's going, is into one of those lists. So a company like ours will occasionally buy a list. And then I, I import it into the system. And then I run this kind of differential query on it to see which one's in there we've never talked to before. So those are the set operations. And I don't spend a lot of time on them because they're self-explanatory. You run it, and you change the word from union to accept to intersect. Now, there is one. Remember earlier I said there's three and a half operators? I'm going to go back to union again. 
the joy that is the union. Right? So give me all the unique, distinct values coming from both queries. There's another one called union. All. Oh. The most pointless query ever. Why? Anybody want to take a guess what this is going to do? Gives you everything. So it says, take the values from this and give me all of them. So you end up with 1,400 and change. 11,430. That number sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because that's the union, the union, union all. It grabs all the values from both tables and gives them to you. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there, of course, there's its, it has its use in the world. If you just want to grab all the email addresses regardless and just do it. Or maybe you're building, you're rebuilding a new database system where you have old leads that are in one bin and then new leads in a new bin and then you just bought a trade show pack from some company and a magazine pack from someone else and you've decided that you want to consolidate all these different bins into one. And then you might want to use union all to build your data set. That way you know you're not going to miss anything. Because the more columns you add to your union or to your intersect, the more points of uniqueness you start developing. Yeah? Well, it's not number of tables. You can have really complex queries on both sides of the union. And I'll show you guys one in a few minutes. Uh, just so you know how bad it is. Or it can be. However, you can have union, 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 accept, union, union, accept, to your heart's content. Uh, I have one query which is, I'm not allowed to show you. <laughs> because it builds some of the security features, features for our software. But the query itself is about that long. And there's three unions and an accept. And what's interesting is it goes, it'll start processing from the top down. So it'll do union, 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 union. Then if you have an accept at the end, it'll strip out anything of all the previous combinations put together because the accept, the la very last one trumps it. So it's cumulative. So, you know, it's like playing old video games where there's no save points. You know, level one, great, level two, great, level three, I'm on level three, woohoo, level four, ghosts and goblins, back to level one you go. Because that's just how games were. But you, these set operations are similar to that. Um, Oh, I hope I've got one of those queries on my machine. I just said I'm going to show you one of those queries, and I don't know for a fact if I do have one. Do I? Give me a second, I'm trying to connect to work, see if I can get it to work. I don't think that's going to happen. I love the network here. Um, No, not that one. Oh, well, there's a... Uh... Okay, well, this will work. This is probably the worst query you people have ever seen in your life, so... Let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay, worst query known to man. This is one query, okay, and it goes on forever, okay? As you can see, me, we're asking how many tables can I have? I'm using this as an example. 
See all these things here, one after another? And right at the end, except. <laughs> what this is doing is it's saying, give me all the security devices, period, except the ones where custom people have upgraded. This is actually a really old query I wrote years ago to find products that haven't been upgraded yet. So I could find customers that hadn't upgraded, upgraded their products yet to basically the version 7 family. And you'll see right here where there's my core there. There's my, you know, my subquery, and the subquery has an accept inside of it. And I, yeah. Nope. Well, there we go. That's a good one. How many of you know how about know about accounting? Okay, accounts receivable, accounts payables in the general ledger. Okay, this this really complicated query, as you can see right here, I even have uh, this the select part of the select thing uh, the criteria here, and right down here, this big whole query, the unions with another one. What this big query is going to do? is it figures out how and there's see there's a third union and a fourth union so for that's about as bad as SQL gets because unions work on full sets of data joins allow you to to connect existing sets of data the problem is with accounting systems when people owe you money it gets complicated Banking people should know when people owe you money, it gets complicated. People that have worked with accountants know when people owe you money, it gets complicated. Because an accounts receivable is just not an accounts receivable. There's the accounts receivable if it's a certain kind of account. There's also the accounts receivable if they got a terms and conditions. There's the accounts receivable that have gone into collections. And basically what this query does, it goes and collects all the different receivables from everybody and shows us one final number, how much oh, who owes us what. Um, but that is actually some of the worst queries you'll ever see. Well, that one's simple. Jeez, compare what you were just looking at. That's simple. But those are real queries that get used on a regular basis. Um, Once again, that's also looks really complicated, but it's not. That's actually a pre. That's a that's a snapshot into our database where I work, that controls all our products. Because you can see, you know, how a package has a version. Their products have versions, and then there's product types that are all interconnected. And essentially, what this is doing is building anything that's not version five and up. But it's a really complicated query that doesn't. That this one runs in about half a second, because I'm filtering out so much crap. Um, but yeah, that accounting one was a good example of a really complicated one. Mm -hmm. And um, it's about as bad as it gets. It's this one here. And yeah, this one here is a good example. Actually, I like this example because this one's simple right here, where you've got a, a, a set operation in the middle of another bigger query. Okay, the good news is I don't expect any of you guys to ever write anything like this. If I was asked to write, no, ever. I, if I, if I, was not, I wouldn't have been expected to write this coming out of school either. This, took, this particular query probably took me a day to write. And I was very familiar with the data happening under the scenes. I knew what the rules were of engagement. Okay, now this leads me to the rest of today. And it's where people feel upset. Always. Okay. It doesn't show up to you guys yet. Why? Because I hate people doing tests while I'm teaching. <laughs> Test 2 is going to be live as of... 
42 minutes from now. It's the same deal as test one. It's based on the hybrids in the textbook. It's testing you on the the, the wording concepts, the you know the wordy concepts basically that you see in the textbook. Um, it's the same size, roughly as the last one. Same format of questions. You've been through one, so you know what to expect for the second one. You only get one try, but you can save and resume. You have one week to do it. And then there's another week for those that insist on taking penalties. <laughs> no, really, there's some people that just like being penalized. Hurt me more. So please don't be late because it really sucks to fail because you were late. Um, which leads me to assignment two, because I always give them out in pairs. Assignment two, I'm going to start with uh, a Futurama moment. Good news, everyone. You're working by yourselves. So you don't have to rely on anybody else. And you don't have to rely on somebody else's spelling or somebody else not following the rules for their naming conventions. <clears throat> All nine of you. Basically put, it's a two-part assignment. So what happens is the first one is I give you guys a really crappy looking diagram. You are to rebuild this diagram. So this is a bit of a refresher assignment from the first part of the term. It's actually there's three tables, there's a big pile of stuff that's wrong with it. And as you read it, you have been handed a diagram by a junior developer. Apparently he wasn't paying attention to his introductory database class. And he created a diagram that makes you want to cry. Fix it. <laughs> as usual, you will be crucified on naming conventions. And as you can tell, this one's only worth six, uh, it's only worth 11 points. Five of those 11 points is naming conventions and structure. That's half the points. Even better, I give you a point for naming the file right. How much you want to bet there's going to be six of you that's going to lose that one point? People are laughing. I'm using that as a historical statistic. But I do have to say, actually, I do have something to say about the first assignment after I'm done. Okay. Part two. Now it says shows ThinkCube backup. If you've already restored ThinkCube, you don't need to bring it back. All right, so this is the same file you're using for this week's lab. So the only reason I have it included here is because every once in a while somebody's laptop goes poof and they don't have the database file. What this is, is it's a random set of questions. They will ask you, how many of this are there? You will type in an answer. Yes, but I don't want the SQL statement. I'm going to ask you for a number. Or I will ask you, what is the name of? Or what country is this? Or how many, which product did not sell? Those kinds of questions. And if I remember right, it's 10 questions. Off the top of my head, I'm drawing a blank, but I'm pretty sure it's 10 questions. This is an assignment that's also a preview to something else. Uh, uh. As you guys may have remembered, and I've mentioned it, the final exam is a two-parter for this course, right? There's a practical exam and a theory exam. And they're worth 20% each. You know how your final exam grades 40% of your final grade? They're worth 20% each. So the two totals added together gives you 40%. There's a practical exam. That one's done in class. That means you've got two hours. That's almost just like this. So take your time doing this one. You don't get to submit it more than once because then it's not really an assignment, right? But you get to do this one. Take your time doing it so you get a good feel. 
It's sort of a, a mini preview of the final exam one. So since this is a two-part assignment, the two scores get added together, and that's your score for assignment two. The other good news is the second you finish this, you'll know what your score is. It doesn't have to wait for me. Now, I've had people argue with me about some of, the, some of them, and the questions have gotten more flexible to handle how they interpreted the question. Because like with everything else, interpretation, if they can make a good case of how they interpreted the question, and, I can, and it actually makes sense, I'll arrange, uh, adjust the question to allow an extra, a different kind of answer or an additional answer. Now, if the question asks something like, give me all the cost, how many customers are in Canada? And you turn around and say, well, you give me a list of customers that are in the US. And they go, well, it's almost like Canada. But it's not. <laughs> it's, we're not American. Um, so that's that. Um, you guys have two weeks to do it. So it's not crushing. Like, literally, this one's not crushing. Like, this is 10 times easier than the lab you just did. Just putting it out there, this is 10 times easier than the lab. That, like I said, that lab was, after I've seen everybody struggle with it, I realized how crushing I made it. And I felt kind of, kind of guilty. Just a little. Yes? You can save and continue. <laughs> It's textbooks. No, it's textbook. Yeah, that's just like the first test. Yeah, I think I made sure I don't have to fill in the blanks. So I think it's multiple choice and uh, true false. I'm pretty sure I made it. I checked it like that. I will go double check. Or somebody, somebody send me an email to tell me to go double check. So, because if I remember it, I made sure there wasn't fill in the blanks because it causes too much grief. Yeah, and I will actually be even kinder to you guys. Hang on, I just got to bring my Firefox window over for a second. I'm going to be a little bit kinder to you guys. <laughs> okay. One more thing. I just turned on two things you couldn't see before. This is found under test. I got a practice exam, practical, including instructions. These are similar to what you're getting in the pra the you know in assignment two, and it's also very. This was my practical exam from two years ago. So literally, this is the exam my students got two years ago, and actually, the new practical exam is easier than this one. Uh, why? Because I was told that I teach too much advanced SQL, and that the other teachers don't cover it to the same level that I did. Therefore, their students couldn't answer my questions. Uh, <laughs> however, um, this is a very similar format to what you're going to get in the real practical exam. It is random order, random questions, and it comes from three separate pools. If I remember it, there's five easy questions, five medium questions, and one, oh God, what is this? And the, oh God, what is this question is actually set up that it's possible to get it kind of right. Partially correct. If it all depends on how you interpret the question, so an interpretive one. You'll see when you try it. I do recommend to give this one a whirl because it gives you a bit of a preview of what to expect out of assignment two. And it gives you a big preview of what to expect out of the practical exam. And if I remember, I even got it set up so you can do it multiple times. Then you can just keep doing it and doing it and doing it so you can practice your SQL with it. And it'll tell you if you were right or if you were wrong.
They won't tell you if your SQL is correct, they'll tell you if your answer is correct. And if your answer is wrong, go do it again until you get it right. All right, guys. Oh, which means since this is an assignment and this is a test this week, what does that mean for next week's class? <laughs> well, I'll be here. But it means that there's no lecture next week as if you're having issues with the assignments. This applies to both lab and lecture. I will be present, but I will not be wearing a tie next Tuesday. Theoretical. Uh,